Hello Year 4 and today's date is Wednesday the 27th of January and we are going to continue with our reading journal. Okay, so we are going to look at, we're going to listen to chapters 7, 8 and 9 today. So just a quick recap. So, so far then, we have uh, met Fintan Fedora who has decided to try and impress his dad by going on an expedition to Brazil in search of the Brazilian choco plum. Um, his poor butler, Gribbly, has to go with him. And of course, as we've found out, lots of unfortunate accidental events keep happening. Um, in the meantime, uh, we've got Eric and Edith Bumstead, Bumstead and they have come up with a plan to try and kidnap Fint and Fedora and um, try and get a ransom for him, so a lot of money for his return. So far, they have been unsuccessful in their plan. Um, and Fint and Fedora is none the wiser that somebody is trying to kidnap him. So we've got to the point now, um, Fintan. They went to the airport, uh, Fintan decided that he didn't want to fly, he was too nervous of flying, so they went to the port, didn't they, and they were just about, well, they boarded the ship Magnifico, was it, yeah, Magnifico, big cruise ship with lots of cabins, and somehow they'd managed to escape the kidnappers. Okay, so I'm going to continue then with chapter seven. Meanwhile, back at the airport, the Bumsteads were putting their new plan into action. They had spent a few frustrating minutes following their targets around, waiting for an opportunity to pounce. There always seemed to be too many people around. Eventually, the air steward and stewardess turned into a quiet corridor and paused to talk outside an unlocked store cupboard. The Bumsteads leapt into action. With a flurry of pushing and shoving, they hurriedly bundled their victims into the cupboard and overpowered them. Not so much overpowering them by force, but by surprise, and by the revolting pong they were giving off. Give us your uniform, snarled Edith. Yeah, added Eric, menacingly pointing his finger and pretending it was a gun. Amazingly, the terrified pair did what they were told. Eric pointed the finger gun at them while his mother tied them up with a cable from a floor polishing machine and gagged them with dirty cleaning cloths. The cloths stank horribly, but not as badly as the bumsteads. Moments later, they emerged guiltily from the cupboard and locked the door behind them. The uniforms, of course, didn't fit. Eric's jacket was so small that he could barely do the buttons up across his fat stomach, while Edith hung down to her knees and the sleeves covered her hands. Neither of them had managed to do their ties up properly, and they were both still wearing their grimy old trainers. The additional fact that they still smell very strongly of dung and that Eric looked like he'd recently fallen into a greenhouse full of cacti didn't help the authenticity of their disguises either. Worse still, they looked absolutely nothing like the photos on their security passes. Eric found a felt pen in his jacket pocket and made a few hasty alterations, which didn't help. However, they'd have to do. He thought with luck no one would look at them too closely. Right then, he said, rubbing his hands with anticipation. All we have to do now is find him and his hours. After an hour of wandering around the check-in area, scouring the crowds for a glimpse of Finton, the optimism began to fade a little. They've got to be here somewhere, snarled Eric. We know they're going to Brazil because we saw them queuing to check their bags in. They must have gone through the departure lounge or something. Edith crossed her arms, rolled her eyes and sneered. Oh well, in that case we've lost them, haven't we? How are we supposed to go through the departure gate without a plane ticket? I don't know why I ever listened to your stupid ideas. I really don't. Eric tapped the side of his nose with a dung-stained finger. No, we haven't lost them, Mother, he whispered. We've got these brilliantly convincing disguises on, remember? We're cabin crew. We can go through without a ticket. And no one will take any notice. Trying not to look too self-conscious, the bumstead shuffled over to where the tickets were being checked. Taking a deep breath and thrusting their hands into their pockets to look even more casual, 
they began humming an out-of-tune version of Come Fly With Me and walked nonchalantly through the gate. There, you see, said Eric triumphantly. When they reached the other side, no problem at all. Piece of cake, we've definitely got him now. They were just debating whether to stick together or to split up and search separately when they were interrupted by a loud, angry voice. You two, it barked. Where on earth do you think you're going looking like that? Someone with a red face and a big curly moustache who looked suspiciously like a pilot was striding towards them, waving a clipboard. Eric froze with fright. Uh, Brazil? He muttered uncertainly. I was beginning to think you weren't going to turn up at all. And look at the state of you both, for goodness sake. Smarten yourselves up at once. Edith looked at the floor like a schoolgirl being told off and fiddled with her badly knotted tie. Eric smoothed down his horrible greasy hair with his dirty hands, which didn't make it look any better. Uh, OK, sorry, he mumbled guiltily. And then, as an afterthought, added, Sir? The pilot looked thoroughly unimpressed with his new recruits, but was apparently desperate enough to put up with them. Hurry up and get yourselves on board, you scruffy pair. There are passengers to greet. Less than an hour later, the pair of supposed kidnappers found themselves at 30,000 feet over the Atlantic, serving endless cups of tea and coffee to everyone on board. After they'd pushed their wobbly trolleys up and down the aisle a few times, it eventually dawned on them that Finton wasn't on the plane. A discovery which meant they didn't smile quite as much as cabin crew are supposed to and swore considerably more. Oh dear. <laughs> I'm very surprised they managed to get on the plane. Anyway, chapter 8. 30,000 feet below them, Finton was enjoying his Atlantic cruise enormously. The food in the restaurants was excellent. There were movies to watch any time you felt like it. Games, arcades to lose your money in. Souvenir shops where you could buy little plastic things you didn't need. And numerous interesting passengers on board to chat to while learning, while leaning on the rail and watching the sea roll by. The crew would even make you peanut butter sandwiches and deliver them to your cabin at any hour of the day or night. Gribbly, however, was having slightly less fun and had spent most of his time on deck desperately breathing in the sea air and trying not to be sick. He looked at his watch and sighed. If only they'd taken the plane, they'd be in Brazil already. Instead, he had to suffer several days of rolling seas and a horribly rolling stomach. On his third day, very ple on his third very pleasant evening on board, Finton strolled happily to the fanciest dining room looking forward to another large excellent meal this particular evening he found himself seated opposite a very tall american man with a shaved head a neat little goatee a gold earring and a very expensive looking suit the man confidently ordered an extremely expensive meal of caviar something called lobster thermidor and an even more expensive bottle of vintage wine Vint vinton decided to go for the sausages chips and chocolate milk the American man reached across the table and shook Finton's hand, as if he were trying to squash it. The name's Wrench, he announced loudly. Max Wrench, call me Max. Oh, OK, said Finton, as his hand was enthusiastically crushed in the man's big meaty paw. I'm Finton. You can call me Finton. I'm going to Brazil, he added, attempting to make polite conversation. Hey, you don't say, me too, laughed Mr Wrench. That's kind of lucky, because that's where the ship's going. Ha ha ha! There followed a short, awkward silence, during which Finton stuffed his mouth with chips, and Max Wrench wondered whether he could go and sit at another table and avoid talking to this little English idiot for the duration of his fancy dinner. Are you on your holidays, Mr Wrench? asked Finton. Eventually... Yup, sure am, said the man, through a mouthful of lobster. I'm on vacation with Mrs. Ranch, my good lady wife. We've done Europe. Now we're going to go and stay at the biggest, most expensive hotel in Rio. Then we're going to tour a few of the islands, do a little scuba diving, pick up a few expensive souvenirs, do a little sunbathing on the yacht, you know. Finton didn't know, but nodded enthusiastically as if he did. Where is your wife, Mr. Wrench? Uh, I mean, Max, isn't she having any dinner? Dinner? No way, poor Barbara's in her cabin. She gets seasick. Ah, I know what you mean, said Finton. 
My butler, Gribbly, has got the same problem. Hates sea travel. Poor man's got absolutely no appetite. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he was throwing up over the side as we speak. Sick, flying everywhere, I expect. Wrench stopped chewing his lobster for a moment and tried not to picture sick flying everywhere. How about you, kid? You on vacation too? He asked, attempting to change the subject. Well, not really. It's more of a sort of a business trip. I'm in the cake business, you see. Wrench appeared pleased to hear this, mainly because he was also in the cake business and it would give him a chance to show off. Hey, really? Me too. I'm head of marketing strategies with Mommy's Yummy Cake Co., part of Giganti Foods International, the biggest cake producer in the world. You must have heard of us. Finton hadn't, but nodded anyway. Guess that makes us rivals, eh? snorted Mr. Wrench, devouring his expensive dinner and laughing at the silliness of the idea. Finton felt the need to stick up for his family's business. Oh, I'm head of uh, cake things at Fedora Fancies, he lied, trying to sound impressive. UK. Yeah, never heard of him, sniggered Wrench. Finton decided he didn't like this man at all. He was rude and big-headed and loud, and he chewed with his mouth open. Worst of all, though, he was sitting there in his fancy suit with his silly beard, treating Finton as a silly kid who didn't belong in the world of business. How dare he? Finton felt a sudden need to show off, too. I shouldn't really tell you this, he began, leaning forward and low in his voice, but we're going on a secret expedition to the jungle. We're searching for the rare choco plum fruit. Max Wrench put down his knife and fork and stared at him with an amazed expression. No way! You're kidding, right? He said awestruck and laughed a little too loudly for Finton's taste. The choco plum? Ha <laughs> ha, you dummy! That's just a kid story! Ha ha ha! Finton found this remark very insulting. He wasn't a kid and he didn't like being called a dummy. He had it on very good authority that the choco plum was real. He'd read about it in Young Adventurer magazine, which he'd been reading for years. Young Adventurer didn't write stories that weren't true. Hell, if the choco plum were real, I'd know about it continued Wrench, between bursts of laughter. I've been in the cake business 30 years, and I know everything there is to know. I tell you, if the Choco Plum were real, you can bet there'd be a gigantic Foods International Choco Plum range at the top of the market. Ha ha ha! In search of the rare Choco Plum, you're a funny kid. Finton poked sulkily at his chips and tried to ignore the man showing off. He reached for the ketchup bottle and accidentally knocked over Wrench's expensive vintage wine. The whole bottleful sloshed onto the table and flooded the man's plate of caviar and lobster thermidor. Right, chapter nine. The following evening, Finton was out on the deck taking a bracing walk. The wind was blowing hard and the canvas covers on the lifeboats were flapping noisily. The sea heaved resent relentlessly up and down in the darkness. On his second lap of the enormous deck, he came to the stern of the ship and saw Gribbly gripping the hand rail and leaning over the side. Hello, Gribs, old man, he shouted over the noise of the wind and the crashing waves. Still feeling a bit rough, eh? Gribbly turned his very grey-looking face towards him and forced a nod of the head. Poor old you. Still not long now. We should be there in a couple of days. Gribbly smiled weakly and wished Finton would keep his cheerful remarks to himself. Mind you, don't lean over too far, Gribs. You might fall in. Finton hollered wittily as Gribbly returned his attention to being sick. You must never, you must be ever so hungry by now, he continued. Can I get you anything? I had some lovely sausages and chips again tonight. Nice and greasy, just how I like them. Suddenly Finton felt someone slapping him heartily on the back. Hey kid, how's it going? Boomed Wrench's annoying loud voice. Finton turned round and said, Oh, I'm okay, thanks, he said. Sorry about your lobster thermostat. It was an accident. Honest, it was. The man waved a hand to indicate it was nothing. He had easily afforded a replacement dinner and another bottle of wine. So, have you found the legendary chuckle, chuckle plum yet? He boomed, apparently still finding the idea hilarious. At that point, Gribbly decided he'd heard quite enough about greasy food and lobsters. He shuffled unsteadily away below deck in search of a toilet. He wouldn't feel any less sick in there, but at least he wouldn't have to listen to Finton's cheering him up anymore.
The American man was still laughing at his own joke. Hey, when you find them, make sure you let me know, okay? When you're a charcoal plum millionaire! Or who knows, maybe I might just get there first and beat you to it. <laughs> it may have been meant as a joke, but Finton didn't find it very funny. Jacko plums, snorted the man. You wait until I tell the guys back home about this. Finton watched as the annoying man strolled away to the opposite side of the ship, laughing loudly to himself. It was only then that he noticed Gribbley had gone. Finton stared blankly at the railing where he had been standing. There was no sign of him. The wind whipped sharply around his head and the dark sea sloshed around in a mess of spray. But there was no Gribbley. He's fallen in, thought Finton with a sudden cold dread. Gribbley's fallen in. For a moment, he just stared over the side in helpless panic, then started to run backwards and forwards in an even more helpless state of panic. He followed this by shouting, Man overboard! at the top of his voice, even though no one could hear him. Suddenly, he spotted a red and white life belt, belt with Magnifico written on, on it on the ship's bulkhead, grabbed it, dashed back to the railing and hurled it into the darkness like a huge frisbee. Unfortunately, Finton had thrown it directly into a gale-force wind, which immediately turned it round and hurled it backwards across the ship. At that very moment, on the opposite side of the deck, Max Wrench was making a long-distance phone call to his boss, Gigante Foods International in New York, keen to share the hilarious story he'd just been reminded of. Hey, Randall, it's me, Max, he yelled, shielding the phone from the buffeting wind. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good, having a good time. Barbara's still kind of ill. But what are you going to do, huh? But hey, Randy, get this. You'll never guess what some stupid kid on the ship told me yesterday. Dumb kid thinks the Chaka Plum fruit story is true. Yeah, he really does. The idiot's actually going to Brazil in search of a charcoal plum trees. A long distance tinny laugh issued from the earpiece of Max's phone as Randall T. Buckmeister, head of Gigante Foods International, joined in with the fun. What did you say? continued Wrench, still shouting into his phone. Who is he? He's a nobody. Works for some scrawny little no hope cake business called Fiborin Fancy or something. I think he's actually scared I'm going to follow him. What's he going to do? Kill me? <laughs> At that precise moment, a red and white life belt with Magnifico written on it smacked into the back of Max Wrench's big bold head, hurling him over the railing and down into the sea where he disappeared with a muffled splash. Gasping for breath and shocked, witless, he surfaced and grabbed hold of a trailing length of rope. Luckily for him, the life belt had caught on a bracket protruding from the side of the ship. Help! he spluttered as he dragged along up to his neck in freezing seawater with his free hand. Max groped in his soggy pockets for his phone, but realised it must be heading for the bottom of the ocean. On the other end of the phone line, Randall T. Buckmeister was still laughing, but wondering why there had been a loud thud followed by a strange gurgling noise. Still in the state of utter confusion, Finton rushed down the ship's corridor, shouting, Man overboard! in a hysterical voice. Several elderly passengers came out of their cabins to see what all the commotion was about and were knocked flying as he rushed past. Three uniformed members of the crew managed to catch up with him and attempted to calm down a little calm him down a little sir sir said one of one of the men shaking him by his shoulders and staring into his face please try and remain calm sir we need you to tell us exactly what has happened he fell in shrieked finton not calming down much at all poor old gribbs fell in one of the other men joined in you need to stop panicking and focus sir tell us where he fell in the sea wailed finton thinking that much should be pretty obvious the crew immediately went into well rehearsed action the tallest and most bearded of them all began hauling Finton back out to the deck to identify where they should search, while the second sent a code red to the captain by radio, and the third set about calming the other passengers who had gathered to join in with the panic. On the ship's bridge, a deafening hooting alarm was sounded, and an emergency signal was sent to the engine room to stop all engines. Red lights flashed, the chief engineer stopped doing his crossword, leapt to his feet, and set about instructing the assistant engineers to the shutdown procedure. Men in boiler suits ran clattering along suspended metal walkways, shouting and turning valve wheels. Heavy iron pipes groaned with sudden changes in pressure, and the needles on all the dials flipped madly from side to side. Within a few seconds, both the ship's massive steam turbine engines began to slow, and the massive eight 
5,000-ton bulk of the Magnifico shuddered violently to a halt. Up on the deck, first mate, several other crew members and a large group of passengers had gathered excitedly around Finton, who was pointed to the spot where he had last seen Gribbley standing. More men dressed in heavy waterproof clothing appeared hurriedly on the scene, blew whistles and began lowering one of the ship's lifeboats over the side. You're quite sure it was here? Definitely this side, asked the first mate, who was worried that the gibbering wreck in front of him may not be a very reliable witness. Finton nodded and looked stricken with terror. You're quite sure, continued the first mate. Finton nodded again. And can you tell me who it was that you saw fall overboard? Yes, said Finton, it was him. He pointed a trembling finger at Gribbley, who was standing at the back of the crowd, wondering what on earth was happening. The assembled crowd fell quiet, then turned and stared at the ashen-faced man in a formal black suit who had just returned from the loo. I beg your pardon, said the first mate. Yes, that's him, said Finton clearly. That's the man who... The crew weren't sure whether to be relieved or furious and settled for a bit of both as they watched Finton run over to the man and seize him in a frenzied hug. Thank goodness you're all right, Gribbs, squeaked Finton. I thought you'd fallen in the sea. Gribbley looked astonished but was more concerned than the su that the sudden dramatic hug was making him feel horribly sick again. The crew set about cancelling the lifeboat launch and the disappearing crowd. Messages were sent to the bridge and the engine room that it that had all been a false alarm and that no one had actually fallen overboard at all. Finton spent a few minutes apologising profusely to everyone and a few more minutes being lectured by the first mate for his irresponsible behaviour. He felt thoroughly silly and ashamed, but also hugely relieved that poor old Gribbley hadn't gone to a watery grave after all. When the lecture and the apologies were over, they slowly made their way back below deck. For a brief moment, Finton thought he heard the wind carry a man's voice shouting for help, but put it down to his heightened imagination. Emergencies can do strange things to your senses, he told himself, and headed back to his cabin. Well, what an unfortunate turn of events that was. Oh dear, I wonder if the loud American man will be saved. All right, so chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine, and I'll leave it there. Okay, bye for now, year four.